Okay, just about time. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Leo Chalupa. I'm chair of uh, Neurobiology, Physiology, and Behavior. And I'm acting as host today, and Ted Jones will be host for tomorrow's lecture. So it's a great pleasure, and uh, we say this uh, quite often, but in this case, it really is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Pashka Rakish, uh, who's here from Yale University, where he's professor of neurobiology and neurology, as well as founding chairman of what is now the Department of Neurobiology. I think it'd be fair to say um, that uh, Dr. Rakish is the preeminent developmental neurobiologist, and he's held this position for uh, at least 30 years. He has a knack of uh, kind of asking fundamental questions and doing these tremendously creative experiments so that his work has been in the forefront of whatever particular issue he's addressed. And uh, for those of you who are in developmental biology, you know what I'm talking about. Let me give you a little bit about his background. It's a very interesting background. He was originally trained as a medical doctor in uh, what is now Croatia, it was Yugoslavia at that time. And he uh, came to Harvard, to Mass General, in 1966 to do a fellowship in uh, neurosurgery. And the chair of the neurosurgery department, after interviewing him, said, you know, um, your accent is a little bit strong, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. So then maybe you shouldn't be dealing with patients right now and go and do some research for a while. And for about 40 years now, he's been in research. So uh, he was at uh, Harvard for about 12 years, and then uh, he came uh, to Yale University as a full professor and founding member of what was then a section of neurobiology. And he's been there ever since. And he's made that department, although it's a very small department, he and the late Pat Goldman Rikish have made the department one of the preeminent departments in the world. So let me introduce him by uh, telling you his title and the evolution of, this. should be a space to the evolution of the human brain. Lessons from Brainology, Archaeology. But it's okay, maybe I can see that. Did you see me spelling there? <laughs> no, no, Mr. Yeah, no, Mr. Well, I'm glad to be again here in the University of California, Davis, and um, when uh, Ted and um, Leo called me uh, to come, and I was glad to, but then they said, you have to give it two lectures. And they said, uh, one would be like a public lecture, and the other would be scientific lecture. So I was very glad that public lecture doesn't have to be scientific. <laughs> and uh, I, I, knew, I knew that, uh, uh, that what is going to be my second lecture on my favorite subject of neural migration, but what would be the first one? And I gave to Leo, actually, a choice. I said, could I talk about medical implications of that or evolution? And he said, oh, talk about evolution. And I see now why. You know, he was hoping that some of the presidential candidates would come. Uh, you know, and they can maybe learn something about uh, uh, evolution. But I actually like to talk. Uh, I'm not evolutionary biologist, but I like to talk about that. And I don't have a chance, so very rarely, uh, 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 people uh, talk about that. But I did spend all my life, uh, you know, on these three species work. And it's very fortunate. Uh, because I started with the human brain, as Leo said, working in neurosurgery, and then went to mouse. At that time, it was a spontaneous mutation, and now continue with transgenic mutation. And then started to make like a transition between mouse and human, and working in the monkey. And it's kind of appropriate here, because you have primate center, should take advantage of it. And now, since it's very popular transitional neuroscience, you know, transitional medicine or research, I try to say that really monkeys transition between mouse and human. And you will see at the end, or even uh, that, that I actually go back and work on, on, a, on a human a little. But, you know, it is interesting working just on these three species. You start to appreciate the evolution. And I was thinking, if only Darwin didn't come to this idea before. You know, just looking at that, I could make uh, that point. Uh, um, so, but actually, evolution, you will see in the moment, have also medical implications. And with use animal models, we should recognize what are uh, evolutionary implications. Now, this is my second lecture, and I mentioned just 
because I was afraid after my first lecture, nobody will come. Uh, so I, that's just to tell you that I'll have very dynamic things over there going on, and I'll talk to you. Our latest thing uh, of, of migration, even someone published data. What's that going on? Oh, I can go to my internet. Okay. Okay. So I will, when I talk about evolution, I'll just talk about cerebral cortex. I have passion for that. I think this is the part that makes us different from any other species. It's not liver, and I'm sorry to those who work on spinal, it's not even spinal cord. It is cerebral cortex that makes it possible I give a lecture and you to listen. And, and so how it develops and how is cortex different? And when I give lectures, and I repeat that very often even to my medical students, how is cortex, or for that matter, brain, in fairness, other parts are very similar, different from any other organ. And I would say that it's a map in which position of neuron define connection and function. And that's not the case for any other organ. Take liver a little lower part or upper part doesn't matter. And you can take one kidney and you know give it as a transplantation and still other work a little harder. But in the brain it is very precise map. And this is what is so fundamentally different. It's not only laminar position, they're how they're interconnected, but in um, uh, not just aerial position here, how they're interconnected in a specific way, but aerial, only these, for example, cells in the layer two or three are those which make those connections when uh, Feldman and Van Essen did uh, here map. The, Ted is known here, and looking at differences, Leah Grubitz, uh, Leah here? Okay. Okay, then I will not mention her work. <laughs> uh, 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 so how it's uh, made, and how it's related to, uh, to, uh, uh, to evolution. Uh, and I would like to devote that to to my professor Yakov at that lecture because it's an evolution. And he was a professor at Harvard Medical School in neuropathology, but he introduced me into the joy of doing developing brain, human in that case. He gave James Arthur lecture. It's a kind of a prestigious lecture in uh, uh, New York uh, uh, Museum of Natural History and on brain evolution. And he said that, he was 34th lecturer, every and biomedical question can be reduced to developmental question. So if you are working on some problem, either it's schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, you end up looking of how a brain was developed and when susceptibility, for example, for the disease occur and so on. And then he was more put to his pipe. By the way, at that time, this was politically correct to smoke a pipe. Uh, and this, by the way, he devoted to me, that was a painting we, we asked artists artist to do for his 70th birthday, and he said, and every developmental question can be reduced to evolutionary question. And I was so happy that, uh, you know, when I was invited many years later to give James Arthur lecture, and I um, gave a talk, and I wish he was still alive to hear, because I was inspired by his uh, uh, talking to him, he, he likes to discuss that and so on. And I learned, I uh, uh, named it lesson from embryo archaeology. And don't look at the Oxford Dictionary for that word as yet, uh, because it's not yet there. But I think maybe one day it will be, and you will see why. Reason is, and I put that on that painting, uh, uh, René Magritte, uh, did, uh, Magritte did Belgian painter, which many people think is French, because most of the painter things are over there in Paris. I do not know. He was a complex man, what he meant. But what I thought he was saying, by looking at this egg and looking in DNA on this egg, there is a secret for every detail of the sh which kind of birds will be, which kind of feather, every little color and every feather, all that was already there predetermined 
only if we knew how. And I was thinking since this is what I call our embryo archaeology, since we, in archaeology, we can look empty skull and we just see how brain become bigger because skull is bigger. We don't know what happened on molecular cellular level. If we ever have a hope to learn how our cortex become, say, bigger or how it become different, it is to look during what happened during embryological stages when brain is made. Because everything what happened in evolution through gene mutation left some imprint. And this is how we will learn, if ever. And I was just thinking that that would be a great thing to do. And um, at that time, I added here, actually, uh, just a newer number. What, what is the difference when you look? Well, obviously, brain is uh, bigger, uh, uh, cortex become bigger. And rhesus monkey about 100 times and human about 1,000 times in surface area than mouse. And this is number of genes. Now, you will ask me why I put uh, 29 in each. I do not know exactly how much. It's about the same time, uh, same number in all of these species. By the way, the biggest deflation was not in the stock market or anywhere else. This is in, in genes because people were saying we have 100,000 and 80,000. For a long time, it was 79. And then it was at 30, and now they said 29. It doesn't matter really, but the number of genes are about the same. I, by the way, tried to get it from uh, Francis Collins, and uh, um, he was very evasive. And I can tell you later on during the interception about our conversation. Okay, now, people say, well, that's people even who believe in evolution said very simple. And this I borrowed a slide from a um, from colleague in Sweden when I was there and some symposium on evolution. Uh, few years ago. And uh, this is that if you breed chicken, take always bigger and bigger, in 40 generation, 41, you have nine times bigger chicken. So this is how evolution, you just select. And this is not a very good way to look at that. Because this is still chick. This is big, but it is still it's maybe good for Kentucky Fry to have that, but this chicken is not smarter than this chicken, and everything is the same, but just the bigger. This is not how evolution works. And when you look, there are qualitative differences. And I put that slide. I'm not going to that because otherwise you will leave even, not only it will not come tomorrow, but we'll leave in today's lecture. These are some of the differences that I myself, looking at the human brain, found. These are qualitative differences, and Ted knows many of them, that some of this we discovered. Actually, all of this we did in my lab. Migration of the thalamus from ganglionic eminence, and you know, so on and so forth. Introduction of new cell type, other people have shown there's some that exist in the human, you know, stellate type of cells and so on. And I'm not going to do that. It would be if we had a course. Uh, but I will mention the word rest of my talk to one part, and this is size. How that, that we have a thousand times larger surface area of the cortex than, than mouse. And I think, I think it's very fundamental because this is the first step. All of this other thing couldn't happen if you don't have these neurons. And so, the difference between mouse and human, and I'm not that naive that I think that, you know, ma monkey evolved from elaboration of rodent brain and then human father elaborate. I recognize these are different uh, branches of evolution, have common ancestor, but they go their own way and specializations. But we could l learn from that. And the one thing that makes a difference and possible is to, to us to be different from other and unique with our symbolic thinking. I said no uh, speech because it's symbolic thinking. You can be deaf mute and still think. This is our ability. This because areas are modified and added. And I show here also Drosophila inometod. I will show you because I mentioned that 
number of genes didn't change so much. I will show one example from nematode, and here is Drosophila with all its wings, so it's actually much smaller brain. Uh, two examples of the genes that in the context in a mouse we could modify cortex and how this could work. Now when people say, well, how this occur, how we have like a, some areas become bigger, frontal lobe become bigger, visual, for example, stay same in monkey and human in absolute size. And there are several, you, there are many opinions, um, many modifications of those opinions or subtypes. But basically one is selectionism versus environmental constructivism. Uh, uh, and this is Lamarckism that's called and that function gradually create organ because you need it and you kind of work on that and it's okay. this is kind of uh, uh, basically proven incorrect by long ago but then came Darwin and that selection of functionally useful inherited I put in red changes this is very important because what you do would never uh, affect uh, your children I mean their inherited characteristic. And environment, this is what Lysenkoism was. And I was, as Leo mentioned, in Belgrade. We were in Eastern Europe. And that was the official, at that time, politically correct thinking. That environmental, uh, uh, environment create phenotype through change of genome. You know, famous thing. And this is I'd like to give that lecture. I don't have to prove anything, just uh, to remember what I read <laughs> in, uh, in newspapers even. Um, and uh, is, you know, he said how we will beat America in, in uh, you know, food production. We have big Siberia. It's not good for wheat because it's too cold. But we will plant the wheat, and over the years, wheat will accustom. To, uh, you know, to cold and next year will be better and, uh, and until wheat will grow in cold because cold would uh, uh, make uh, future generations stronger and stronger by experience uh, of the cold. And you know where they went uh, with, their, uh, with their food program, whereas here by doing selection, genetic selection, we made uh, much better and high production of wheat, and we have to not only to sell them, but to give them, okay? So that was defeated, but I think that here in this country, in neuroscience, I see something, and this is another word that I created, that people think that environment creates brain, new brain connections, and over time that affects, so that, uh, uh, and this I call neurolysenkoism. Okay, now when I gave that lecture, I prepared that lecture when when I gave uh, this uh, uh, James Arthur lecture in um, in New York, and so I kind of made that drawing, and I was intimidated because I a uh, member of their uh, committee was still alive I was um, uh, Steve J. Gould, who's American, the most that time prominent uh, evolutionary biologist and what he would say of that. And I tested that with my secretary actually, Carol, because she believed in evolution. She was actually a teacher of evolution. But this is what most people made a mistake. And this is, I say what, the, I made this drawing and say what is correct. And she looked, she believed that, you know, she said obviously this second is correct. Because, um, you know, giraffe, uh, this is common ancestor of, gi of giraffe, um, you know, was extending and over thousands of years, every year, in you know, a couple of um, quarter of inch and so on. And then it transferred to the next generation. This is called continuous variation, slow transition, um, and making longer and longer neck because it's advantage to the giraffe to eat the leaves, whereas this guy here couldn't find enough food could not reproduce, so this longer head was advantage for, uh, for getting a female and getting an offspring and survive. But actually, it is uh, 
what is happening suddenly. Giraffe have the same number of, uh, like in the predecessor, like most mammal, 32 vertebrates. It's just that at one point, these vertebrates were three times longer and then extended it. And it was the advantage for this animal. It could occur once. And if this occurred, by the way, in Sweden, you wouldn't see giraffe because too cold probably will freeze their, their neck. And, uh, but in savanna of Africa was advantage and there were more and more giraffe and they survived. I was very glad that, that Steve Good liked this and said that's correct. And I was very glad because you know, he was a controversial figure even though he was the best at that. But I think um, he was uh, often right and I was always uh, uh, thinking he was right when he did agreed with me. And, um, and what, what he taught me, I was thinking, well, what, people say, what is the chance that this, that this occur? And he said, this, that is slow occur. Every, you know, thousand years or every hundred thousand years on the same gene and each time for a quarter of, of inch, it is million times or maybe more less likely than it occur once and it's big. And it's big in advantage. However, there are many mutations that didn't work on environment didn't work. I put that because I think what happened there maybe is how it's happened with the, with the question of enlarging our own cortex. So I said, how would this apply to areas? Now, I mentioned that these connections are made in a specific way. And this is what makes the difference between us and other species. But if you go to Society of Neuroscience, most of the people study how connections are made. 98% and so on. But let's reduce it, how connections are made between, say, visual and, I remember, you remember that, that uh, map of Van Essen and others, how connections are interconnected. You can study how this make. So I kind of reduce, like, these are areas. So if A contact B and B contact C and so on, this is, this are reciprocal connection with some area. If you want to make these connections, before you make connections, you have to have neurons. So you have to in make enough neurons. For a human, you have to have a thousand times more neurons. And neurons are larger number. Okay, you have to A, B, and C. Then, if you, since these connections are not random, A must be different from B, must be different from C and D. You don't even have to do experiment. There was a controversy at one point whether all neurons in the cortex initially are equal. This is so-called tabula rasa hypothesis. But people who are thinking about that in a conceptual way or theoreticians say, you don't have to do experiment. It's impossible that if neurons are equal, you couldn't have a brain in which all of you have occipital lobe here and frontal here and all of these connections repeatable from individual to individual, and neuropathologists look at the brain, don't see difference between two individuals. So this basic thing has to be there. However, and you will see this has come to what I'm studying in my scientific life, is that none of these neurons are generated in the cortex. You will see that. And this is how cortex is different from other organs, because liver Neurons are generated in the liver next to each other. Here, they, none of them in the cortex. So this is a, just a little for public lecture. And actually, I have a evidence, maybe tomorrow we'll show some of this, that progression of cortical neural stem cell from embryonic stem cell to neural stem cells, then go to neuronal progenitors. And this would be like a for progenitors uh, Projection neurons, like pyramidal neurons, one, two, three over time. There are different progenitors. And then some of them diverge from neural progenitors to interneurons progenitors. Those progenitors, which pro interneurons don't make pyramidal cells. So these so-called stem cells are different. And then, of course, then they diverge and become astrocytal oligo. So actually, we all hear about 
stem cell and many are interested how they could be maybe used for uh, replacement therapy. But I'm interested that in stem cell is a secret how you made that cortex in the first place. And so I'm adding here, not all neuron cells are created equal. Tomorrow when you talk of migration, you will see significance of it. Today I just go and tell you that there are many labs we show now, and this is now generally accepted, I put just here, I don't know, a dozen names, that progenitors over time generated different classes of neurons. Now, could we follow their journey? That would be tomorrow. Yes, we can. But, and we can study neurogenesis in vivo. But now, how they are generated, I have to say that if I want to talk about evolution. I mentioned corticosumab in which position the fine function. But it's interesting, the time of neuron origin defined position. And this is how we could study. When I entered the field, it was not yet there. Only through the, about late 60s and 70s introduced timidine studies. I see H3 timidine. It's one of the nuclei that go to the dividing cells and then um, if it is radioactive, one electron is a little different uh, uh, than uh, it, in the molecule so that uh, you could detect that this cell was generated at the time when timidine is available and it's available only for 10 minutes, then we become destroyed. And this was generated either before or after because after is diluted and this may be divided once more time. So it's very quantitative and you see you can stain, this is glial cell, this is neuron, that's labeled, that's not. And then in dark field, you see how cells are labeled. Later on, people start to use deoxybromouridine. It's now very often used. This is different molecule. This is substitute for timidine. They have different structure or formula, but could be incorporated in DNA, it can be detected like that with fluorescent. It's a kind of easier, but you will see, have some problems. So, I know some of my colleagues like Leo and Ted have seen that slide many times. And he has to travel all the way to Barcelona to see that slide last time. But I think the um, uh, point is I'm showing that for those maybe who are not since this is public lecture. For me, it was fascinating when I saw it first time and still fascinating. If you, for example, inject monkeys pregnancy last 165 days, 50 embryonic day, you label this pyramidal cell. But if you take another animal and inject, you know, 20 days later, you label these stellate cells, okay? So this, every cell have a different time. And in visual system, you go, first, this, each line represent one animal, and then I plotted the cell. And 54, label 5, 62, 6, and like that. And the last cell generated in monkey was, this is birth, 165 days. Two months before birth, around 100 days. And this is last cells because they are around here in layer two on the border of layer one, which is at that time marginal zone. This is labeled cells, 102 embryonic day. And later on, we made injections. We can label glial cells, but not neurons. So I kind of thought that this is uh, something that is interesting and you don't have any more neurons. We looked very hard, other people did. And then come discovery of the century. And you will see that it has relevance to evolution. This is why I put it there. That neurogenesis, thousands of new neurons daily just in the principal sulcus. And you see here cells migrating to, to the cortex. How we could miss that many cells? And by the way, they should be seen even in a Golgi method or even light microscopy. So then, but it, it was published in science, uh, must be truth. But then I read that in the, in the scientist, um, this was about two years later. Uh, the fact that an article makes it to print should not cause us to lower our analytical senses when attempting to built an information provided in that article, regardless of the perceived quality of the journal. I said, okay, so well, well you look, we published three papers in, in science uh, and couldn't find it. 
So how you look at that? This three times more than that. So we repeat it, actually. <laughs> well, you can say three times, uh, yeah. But this is all from our lab. But then uh, that we published, this is with Konrad. Uh, in fairness, science did publish it. And you see, we have seen here that actually it could look labeled cell, but when you look in the deep, going through the deep optical density, that this disappears. That's white, uh, good blue, not blue, I mean, yellow is not in that cell. It's above that cell, but it looks like. So it is like looking from here. You see these cells, you look here, you see it, it looks over nucleus. So it is one of the errors. There are several, this look like a label cells, and it turns out it's not. And then when you turn out at 90 degree, you see that this cell is not labeled. This is glial cell, this is neuron blue, green. So there are technical, there are other problems with that paper, but I think I then, since I devoted that to my professor, he, when he would smoke pack, he would say some other words, and he say, people wanted to see that we have more neurons. So he said, desire is not substitute for knowledge, and enthusiasm is not substitute for information. So why this is, I want to mention, because you will read so many of those papers, BRDU is not marker of new neuron. Many people label, okay, and they publish the paper. It only marks DNA synthesis. It is true it labeled dividing cells, but it's true it could label DNA repair. It's very slow, but if you do multiple injection, you could label them. I think you have here lecture, I saw somebody, Storer gave a DNA repair. Okay, but even more so, before cell death, I'll show you some recent slide. Abortive S phase, this is not just a repairing either strand, it's a totally new strand, S phase, with a, you label with a single injection. So, BRD is mutagenic, can increase rate of proliferation that otherwise would not occur, has mutagenic effect, induce aberrant gene expression of phenotype. You take two dishes and put, say, even bone marrow, and then in one add the oxybromoyurid and you have more divisions, and cell have more variety than in the other one. Um, affects cell function, it's called dis disturbed migration. Obviously, if you have one of the four nucleotide in many genes change with different shape of molecules, that is a havoc, can be incorporated in dying neurons. And New, new neuroglial cells, from neuroglial cells. So, for example, if glial cells is labeled and then die, it can be incorporated in the neuron because there is a so-called fusion that people now prove and can be incorporated in injured neurons. Hypoxia, drug, neurodegeneration. I just want to show you our study. This was with my former student, now Austin professor in Cincinnati. You put hypoxia ischemia in that neuron by ligating one side artery, you have dead cells in the CA. And you could label them before dying almost very well. And then tunnel, this is a method for cell death. And you double label, so these cells will go down. All of them are labeled with the oxybromoyurid. If you are not careful, you could say, look, you get a lot of neurons in hypoxia ischemia. Or if you put toxic substance or animal does too much exercise and so Now you can say three of those are just uh, uh, deoxybromouridin, so there may be new neurons, but don't forget that tunnel is not 100% sure method. Maybe there are new neurons, maybe not. We do not know. And difficult to find something new, so you're happy you publish that, and then my friend uh, uh, Josh Sen sent me that. Pashko, that may, when he was still undergraduate, in Akun lab, he uh, published in 1972, they show, you see, you can incorporate even time within. The cell is not dividing, just damaged by ultraviolet light. So I just want to say this technical thing. And is retrovirus may save? No, Ackerman and others show that it could be, retrovirus could go to microglia that we microfia. This is Ackerman, his first author, Ackerman, but the first uh, senior author is Joe uh, Laturco. University of Connecticut. And then these are my graduate student who wrote the Journal of Neuroscience, uh, this uh, opinion and so on. It goes there and it labels cells. So this cell is 
retrovirally labeled, but not new neurons. It's all neurons. And then finally, of that, before I go to the next stage, is that we look that nuclear DNA synthesis, BRDU, could be labeled in dopaminergic neurons in substantia nigra after MTPT injection. Okay? We just published that two months ago in PNAS. So some people thought that this substantia nigra get new neurons when they die, but actually they, those which die actually incorporate the oxybromo unit. Then we did in human. And in human, with substantia nigra neurons, this was done with a very sophisticated methods called FISH. DNA, you see, you have two. This is a male with two X chromosome and four, I forgot, 18 chromosome. 18, yeah. So in human Parkinson disease patient, before cell die, it doubles its DNA synthesis. You have two times more chromosome in the cell and then die. And then that so-called marker that many people use, PCNA, also label. This is human cells. We just published it. So if you look, cell cycle, all of this that I put in red, this is from somebody's work, uh, NAGI at all, these are different molecules involved in cell cycle, including S phase. All of them are now proven to be engaged in cell death. So each label cell. So I was just in Stockholm a few uh, months, not few months, two months ago, on the thesis defense of uh, Bartway in the Jonas Friesen lab in which they use C14, very clever experiment, C14 labeling. And they show that C14 was very high in the atmospheric uh, in Sweden and in other countries at the time of at, uh, atmospheric atomic blast testing. And so all cells which were at that time created would have C molecule on the level that was at that time in atmospheric as well as in vegetables and everywhere. And this way you could see people born before 1968 and after and so on. And they found that many cells, glial cells in the brain are there, but they came to conclusion the cortical and neurons are as old as the individual. And that kind of made me happy because but this time in study, we did come to that conclusion and published that in, neuro, uh, in, uh, in 1985. But here, what I did have in that paper is, you see, this is gut, this is skin, this is cornea. Why all this, this animal, this is new skin, not last year's skin. You know, my cornea even change. Certainly, uh, well, my hair doesn't change that much. Uh, <laughs> but, but not brain cells. And this is where come, how I, I put that there is because I think it has significance for evolution of the cortex. One other reason why we have decreasing capacity of neuronal terminal during evolution. You see, from fishes, amphibians, you know, salamander can generate all new spinal cord, but we cannot. Mammals cannot, rat cannot do that either, rodents, but more, and primates, which is accomplished by reduction in adult neurogenesis and regenerative capacity. Why is that occur? And by the way, to prove that this is so, I did actually, how, how I'm doing with time? Maybe I will skip over that. Just to mention, too, that we looked and we found that in primates, it's like a 10 times less than in rodent. This is monkey. And here is in the olfactory, very few cells. And so why should we, during human evolution, lose such seemingly useful functions? This is what I did right. It lost a neuronal turnover and continuous neurogenesis has evolved to retain memory or learned behavior that is essential for the survival of our species. In other words, it is important that you keep your neurons because this is over a long time. This our, we are not faster than this zebras or giraffe or stronger than lions, but 
we learn something and we use over time. And the storage of our knowledge is in synapses and connections and, and stored. And if you change that, you would lose it. That was a hypothesis that I put in that paper. Okay. However, price was that it is accompanied by reduction of regenerative capacity. Okay? Now, so how then you form that? You make, and not only that you make neurons that last all life, but you don't make it in the cortex. What a kind of difference. And this, by the way, I did when I was still in Yugoslavia and, and make that experiment in which we put uh, thymidine in the, in the uh, medium and found that cells are proliferating only near ventricle but not in the cortex itself. This confirmed what people knew from the mouse work, like Angevan, Sidman, and others, but put me to see how they migrate. And this is how it happened. If you inject monkey, you label cell near ventricle. Three days later, you put another animal, cell migrate, and end up here. So they go from the ventricle and, the, and migrate. And in human and in monkey, that is much longer than in mouse, speaking on evolution. You see here is a long uh, a track that cells have to migrate all the way from ventricle to come to the cortex. And how they do that, you see there are these so-called radial glia, which was discovered long ago by scientists at the turn of the century, including Cajal and others, uh, Retzius in Stockholm and I don't know, McGee in Italy. Um, and you see, I found using EM that these cells migrate along this light process of radial glia. So this is what happened. They are moving. You will see tomorrow, I'll talk about molecular mechanisms and how this occurred on, the, uh, on the, this level. But today I just want to say that we could see those cells, and I mentioned how this occurred in evolution. Instead of doing that static and sacrificing three animals to prove it, you could see in the slice preparation using confocal microscope. And you see cells divide. And then here is division near ventricle. And could be asymmetrical division. This green one will become neuron and go up. And you see now, I'll show you this on the way to the cortex. This is where they divided. This is cortex. As the individual go to the position, you see it was inside out, first generated, and then second, third, one above the other. And th this is now in the color, this same, same this is pseudo color, just to those who are sitting back to see. They come to the top. So that is in mouse, but you, in human and in monkey, it's even more difficult because cells from this position have to go to the proper position here, and that is provided by this radial glia, which do not divide for a while. So as cortex grow, they keep these highways, and here you see many cells moving along the same path. So this is how we could then label those cells using Maybe i leave it for tomorrow to show you that. So I want to just to show you model. So mo this is model based on, you know, 125 monkeys injected at different time and sacrifice. So this is piece of the cortex. This is ventricular zone. Here where they divide in two zones, ventricular, subventricular. They go and migrate along these pathways. And you see first layer six. And here is the time, age 50, 60, and then layer five come. I don't know, but I who see that many times when I give a lecture get still impressed thinking to which extent evolution went to, to make it possible that one cell bypass previous generated cells and come so that layer six generated, then five, then four, then three, and in that order, I do not deny that there are a lot of connections there that have to be done after. But this is the first step. Cells have to come there. Then now they will make cortical-cortical connections. But they have to be in their position. I just want to stress that out. And on basis of this type of work, I 
formulated this hypothesis, and I will test it in front of you. That two-dimensional mosaic of ventricular zone, which is here where cells are proliferating, is transformed into three-dimensional cortical architecture in which X and Y axis, that is here position of cell aerial, depend on the site of origin here. These cells make this column, and these cells make this column. So by the side of their origin, whereas z-axis, that is within the layers, is provided by time. This is first, the second, third, fourth. In fact, I cannot now resist to not to show you. OK, so this is what you do. You put retrovirus, label one cell, because it's very small percentage of labeling. And then you see how they go. And then number one cell, number two, number three, Number four. These are all cells come from the same from the same mother. Okay. Now, how this related to evolution? Cortex is spent by increasing the surface. We discussed that. A number of radial units. You see, this is human, monkey, and mouse. And cortex is thicker, but not so much. But thousand times in size. How this occur? Because there are more radial units. How this could occur? First step is to increase number of units. That could be occur several ways. And one of this is mode of cell division. And I go with you. If cells are always symmetrically divided, in evolution, or our brain, the fact that we have that map is one step the most important. But second most important in evolution is that cells at one point could make asymmetric division so that two cells are not equal. When you have two equal cells, you increase their number of equal cells. And then later on, you make different types of cells in each division. That occurred during cortex. In early stages, in monkeys, say, before 40 embryonic day, cells are dividing like that. Each progenitor symmetric will make two progenitors. Symmetrical means the two cells are equal. And then, at one point, these progenitors produce one daughter cell, another stay, by asymmetrical division. So number two, number three. Now you see that how many of these units you have depend how many of these progenitors are doing that. And you see, if it's human, it monkeys start here. If you prolong that, just allow three more divisions, you have eight times bigger cortex. Just three more divisions. It could be just one gene. It said divide three times more, and you have three times, not three times, eight times bigger cortex. You get that? OK, so this is called heterochrony. That small timing could produce big changes phenotype. This is kind of used in evolution very often. But I will now do experiments in mouse that show that you could increase larger cortex. I will use one, this is gene from nematode, caspase 3. Nematode is called SAD3, that is killer gene. And what happened in nematode is that, uh, this is people who work on that, like Bob Horowitz showed that if that gene is deleted or incapacitated, inhibited, nematode have more cells, because cells do not die by apoptosis. You hear about apoptosis. So we were first with my colleague uh, uh, to mutate that gene. But cell theoretically, what would happen? You see, cells are dividing, each time symmetrical, make double-double. If this is normal apoptosis, this cell die. Then you have that big cortex. If this, you prevent that cell dying, you have two times bigger cortex. Just one cell. One. So people say, well, there is a very few cell dying. How you explain? thousand times bigger code. One cell could make a double, OK? And you have molecules, and I mentioned to you. So more radial columns are produced by symmetrical division, if you prevent that. And then later on, radial, if you asymmetrical division interfere, you would have taller column or shorter columns. Now, with my colleague, um, actually, Richard Flavel, who is molecular biologist at Yale, we were first to take that gene and 
uh, mutated equivalent of that gene in in mouse. And look, you have a bigger mouse with it. That's not photomontage, okay? It's a real mouse here. And when you look, this is control in the in the same uterus. And this is one which have lack to uh, to uh, a copy of that gene. It become convoluted and have a bigger cortex. And we published that initially, and it took us three years to really fully recognize what that means, is that you prevent here cell death, you have more cells producing, and so you have more columns. And then the brain start to convolute. This is how it could occur. I do not say that it occurred by, we have bigger cortex because we interfere with, with a cast space. It's just that how it could occur, it could be by interfering with proliferation. And I will show you studies that we did with my colleague Leonard Chester with Notch gene. Notch is from the zoophila, and it, it is affecting mode of cell division. So cell could divide and give two new, uh, neurons and a continued divide in neuron, or it could go and go asymmetrically, start to produce glia and stop neurogenesis. And we did show that Notch this is just impressed now in uh, Nature Neuroscience, just accepted last week after a long time. Um, here is that it's present notch and its inhibitor, NUM, is inhibitor of notch, and it's asymmetrically produced uh, in, there in dividing cells. And you could interfere with that. You could force expression of notch, this is intracellular domain of notch, active notch, and you stop neurogenesis and cells detach and become glial. Or you could force NAM, which is inhibitor of notch. Then you continue neurogenesis and cells continue to divide. So you, that, this tremendous power position, use a gene discovered in Drosophila, and then you use it in the particular zone on the mouse, and you can make a cortex bigger and smaller. And so you see, we can put cells to go in this direction and produce more neurons, more of this disease, or to produce more glia. So what you have, normally, the mouse produce neurons, but we, when we force, uh, instruct uh, uh, neural stem cells to stop producing neurons, it, glia become earlier, and we have no neuron. So we have more glia and less neurons. Opposite occur when we do numb. I'm a little rushing. Tomorrow I will mention that molecule in different contexts. But just for evolutionary purpose, think of that. By, by expressing or uh, overexpression of numb, you continue longer time production of neurons, and you delay formation of glia. And finally, I want to say another molecule, which is beta-catenin. This is only slide that was not from my lab. This is from my lab, Upper. We published that. This is control and start to have convolution. But this is from Chris Walsh lab at Harvard. They did this beta-catenin, which is molecule involved in cell proliferation. And they manipulated that and forced it, uh, uh, prevented increased number of proliferation of cells. And this is their control, wild type. And look at that, how they have convolution. Now it's smooth control and convolutions. I was so jealous when he uh, published that because this was really, you see, the cortex is formed because all other machinery is there. You just have more columns and you have larger cortex. I thought, and Chris said, well, after that, I start to believe in radial unit hypothesis. So, when I did uh, start that work, uh, before this, we, we, we have that proven. Um, we, um, this is where I kind of suggested a possible model before we had the gene. And I said, well, it could be genes could be just one gene and it could determine larger size of the cortex. These are radial units in the, in the monkey. These are actually photographs. And these are uh, ventricular zone, which is also radially organized. Tomorrow I'll show you how this is and 
what make that possible on molecular level. But today I just wanted a more general picture uh, of that. And you see that you could increase that number in evolution but just prolonging number of symmetrical divisions. And so, I don't know, they let me get away with that. Said one small step for cell, one giant step for mankind. This is my title in teens. And I suggested that it could be some genes. I didn't dream that since then we did, and I show you three examples, that we could manipulate with these genes to produce a cortex large. Now, this Mice are little, they are not smart or anything like that. And sometimes when I give that, people say, well, you know, how you, you know, couldn't this, if you have more cells, more radial units, like human, monkey have more, wouldn't the mouse be smarter? I said, no, because this is evolution happened. This actually is malformed brain, brain and they cannot even survive. Many other things have to r work well. This is how small chances are. And I said, I just produce few of those mice. But if you give me, you know, grant, 10 million years long grant, I, I could produce smarter mouse. Because I make every day, you know, 20, 100 mice, and uh, maybe 10 million from years from now, one of them will be smart, smarter. This is how I thought of evolution occur and in a way to make it popular. But then you could say, well, okay, so, so what determines the number of units? And I just show you, I went back all the way to study now human brain. And what we, by looking at these early stages, we found, and this is a human brain actually 29 days post conception. And this is before neurons in ventricular zones are ever formed. And you see one big cell here. We couldn't see those cells in mouse. In fact, you, uh, we see some of them, but not so impressive like in human, in the monkey so far. And this is how they come, you see. We don't know actually where they come, but it seems to come here. And our working hypothesis is that this cell, if existing human and not in mouse, could influence proliferation here and determine when and how this number of units are formed there. So I go back at the end of my talk to, to the uh, picture that I showed at the beginning. I don't think that we know enough yet, but we be I believe that if we look harder and continue, and this way, uh, and the young people now with the monkey genome is also published just two weeks ago in science, human genome, mouse genome, we could go and look and find out how this occurred, how this become bird, and how our cortex become cortex. And that would show us, you know, who we are, where we come from, and maybe even where we are going. So I think uh, Leo is right that our presidential candidates should actually read a little about that because that we could learn more about human nature by studying human cortex. And that every question, even in medicine, uh, could be reduced that uh, to, uh, to evolutionary question. And we have to take into, account, uh, into account those differences between mouse, monkey, and human in order to design proper therapy and to understand diseases. So that is the story of the, how I try to, to convey what I thought by looking at these three species over a year and how cortex may evolve. This is just a small piece of it, just how it become bigger. I know many people study how connections are made. That's not enough. It's more complicated story, but one have to make first step. Thank you.
much bigger cortex? Are, are the cortical areas enlarged equally, or is, are there new areas? No, it's not, you see. Uh, it's not, uh, and Ted knows here uh, very well. Uh, and also Leo and probably Leah and others, because you have here a strong uh, 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 background in anatomy. Cortex uh, is not, a mouse is not just a, a, a smaller human, or, or I would put it that way. Human is not just a bigger mouse. In fact, some area, the monkey, for example, Area 17 in monkey is about absolute similar size to human. And so our vision is not better than monkey vision and even analysis of what details in the primary visual area. But our prefrontal cortex or parietal cortex is much bigger. It is what we do with this information. So mouse see the same thing, but we know much more about uh, uh, those things that we see because we then develop further this part of the cortex analysis. And I kind of decided, and Leo told me yesterday, the talk should be like about 50 minutes, and I am known to make it too longer, so I, didn't, I took out some slides. But we have ideas and that how these areas are differentially uh, uh, Enlarge, and you remember one slide at the beginning when I when I saw when I show uh, different uh, different stem cells, and they are different for layer four or five and so on. People sh shown that, but now they are showing that they are different for layer frontal and for other cortical layer. And there is a paper that uh, is uh, uh, impressed now by from Rubinstein lab. It will be in PNAS probably within a month or so, because I kind of communicated that to the PNAS. I knew that in advance. And I fortunately don't have his slides. He showed that there is, he has a molecule, FGF18 or something like that. And it is expressed in the ventricular zone of the fr frontal lobe, but not on the other. And by manipulating, you could make it bigger and smaller frontal lobe without affecting the other. So areas are, therefore, mutations of different areas could test that and enlarge frontal lobe without enlarging visual, uh, say, vi uh, occipital, because occipital is good enough for us. But we should have a little more frontal lobes, you know, thinking and planning for the future. And, and so, so that's... I'm so happy to see that uh, paper will be out in a, in a month or so. But I was just thinking whether to, to show you where I thought, even in my own talk. Um, I have more slides than I, you know, show. Uh, okay, well, it doesn't matter. Is there any more, more questions to ask? I can do two things in the same time. You see that what I show here, when you make a um, uh, narrow stem cell for projection neurons, then I put this and that two projections. This could be, say, frontal lobe, and in frontal lobe, then layer five, six, I mean, six, five, four, and so on, and this would be some other areas. So all neuro uh, is not, this is a problem for, for example, think of substitution therapy, and this was now shown also by Tom Jessel and others in the spinal cord. It's not just to take neural stem cell and inject and think they would just substitute for those that are missing in some neurodegenerative disorder or in trauma. Each of these cells have uh, its own type of neuroprogenitor, which is different from each other. Tomorrow I, I maybe mention something else. Yeah. And did not demonstrate how to produce more radial units. Is this not an important part of your thesis? No, I think they have more radial unit. 
Oh, yeah, they have more exactly. Okay, let's go back. I was rushing at the end, so maybe didn't show that. Exactly radi more, more radial units. In our, we, we have only maybe 30, 40% more. But I think in, um, oh, here it is. You see, this is from here to here. That's wild type. Here, when you look uh, from here to here, when you look like that, it has uh, much more radial units. Here, this is in, in Walsh. Walsh have more than two times more radial units. And if I go now back, where are that? Uh, I beg your pardon? Okay, because, okay, here it is. You see, I should put less and, and explain that. Okay, you see, uh, uh, normally, you see AP, AP apoptosis. This is why I said at the beginning, you see occasional cell death in the ventricular zone. And that controls the number, you see? And if you prevent that, there will be more units here because this produces additional, at this, at this point, when you see more radial glial cells, okay? Uh, so, in in the in the, this scheme, you see there are more because they didn't die. There are more, and you see if you uh, you uh, Ted, uh, maybe you think I'm you see here these are radial units, and here are radial units. So you have here more of them. They go like that, and this is the thing. Okay, so this is one. Sell that. So I have that uh, argument actually when I was in England with uh, Louis Wolpert. He said, Well, there are only few. I will end up with the I like anecdotes, but this is a true story. Okay, so uh, he said, Well, there are only few cell deaths and how you could explain a thousand times. And I said, Look, there is a one cell here, and if you prevent that, cell will be two times bigger. So Louis, uh, uh, Wolpert, he's from Scotland. So I said, how many are in, you know, Wolpert's cl clan now? Like 175, he said. Okay. Supposedly somebody was killed in the war a couple centuries ago. There would be one grave, and there will be no 175 Wolperts. So you don't have to see a lot of that. You, you, you prevent future generation. And this is why this model fits to now several experiments, either by preventing cell death or making more proliferation of symmetrical division. You increase, in this case, this is Chris Walsh experiments, more columns because he have more of these symmetric divisions. We have more uh, uh, columns because prevents cell. And then, by the way, we did, you could, anti-apoptotic factor, you can inhibit pro-apophocty factor. So this is more than one. This is BLC and other mice. So you can do it in a very sophisticated way. So other people are doing that. And Richard Nowakowski have mice here. And then if you prevent that, then you have a thicker cortex because you have more cells in the column, but you don't have more columns. So you have two times of, of uh, speaking of medical implications, two times of malformations. If they occur early, you could have a, Pori microgyria, more, but cortex is thinner. If you occur later, you have thicker cortex, but uh, few, fewer gyra. It fits almost mathematically in. Is that answer your question? No. Now that Ted is clear. He is kind of said yes, but not completely. But we have to uh, we talk work, later. We can work it out. Yeah. Later. There is somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you seem to suggest that it was related to the needs for long-term memory. 
Yes. Uh, is there evidence that actually adding new neural cells actually, if, if we could do it or other organisms do it to whatever degree they do it, that it actually does disrupt long-term memory, adding new neurons? Because we do have a world where neurons die. Do more or add more neurons? Would it actually disrupt long-term memory or be a bad thing? OK, well. Okay, I don't, tomorrow maybe I'll talk a little about that, but I don't have slide with me, which I wanted to show. You see, point is there that if uh, somebody now remind me something what happened 30 years ago, I can reproduce whole picture uh, of what happened. Even when I go back to Yugoslavia, I didn't see somebody 35 years. Oh, yeah, I remember we were sitting there and you know, having cappuccino, and uh, you remember details, uh, what happened. And for that, you don't have one cell or one memory. You engage whole brain, and it has to be there. New neurons would not be able to incorporate into that, and you will see why, because tomorrow, when I show, because you have to have layer five before you make layer four. And in a realer mouse, if you are aware, I show slide tomorrow. One day late, cell is not in the proper position. Mouse real and is kind of mentally retarded. Now, if you inject now a new cell in 52 years old person, you're 52 years late for that. And you don't put that cell before. Maybe one day we will be able to understand that did differentiate the cortex. But those cells would not uh, have only any experience that you as an individual have. So when we have the discussion, sometimes, you know, if I have new neurons in America since I left, I would not have an accent. But I would not recognize my mother when I go back. Because these neurons didn't see my mother. Yeah? So I don't think that a new neuron in Alzheimer would make somebody to recognize their daughter if they don't. He said we don't have time to discuss that interesting question. I could, but for particularly with Ted, so I think that this is not good to you. <laughs>